Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, it's nice to be with you today, and thank you for the invitation to join you to open Govis 2014. I am indeed a die-hard Crusaders fan, and I say with some pride that we showed our typical magnanimity and open-mindedness in the way that we reacted to defeat by England the other night. It was just a temporary blip on the onward march to ultimate success. But that's for another day. Today we're here to make a conference get underway that's very important for the future direction and development of ICT right across the government sector. And I think the opening point is this. We're about to make major positive changes in the way citizens do their business with the government. These changes in customer service and the ICT transformation that will be needed to achieve this actually represent the biggest reforms since the major reforms of the state sector in the 1980s. And we should not underestimate the significance of that. Transformation of this type always brings with it many challenges. The chief amongst them being how we deliver change and new services at the speed that is needed while ensuring there is no inconvenience to our customers and our staff and government are fully prepared to provide those services. So it's a little twist on the tortoise and the hare. And I want to share with you today some of my thoughts on that broad subject. In January of this year, I became the Minister of Internal Affairs for the second time in my career. And it will not surprise you that after 18 years since my previous stint in this portfolio, while many things were familiar, there have also been many areas of change. And the most dramatic area of change is that the portfolio now carries responsibility for transforming the way ICT is managed across the whole realm of government. Now, fortunately, from my previous role as Minister of Revenue, I was not unfamiliar with the concept of ICT transformation, so I already had a good appreciation of both the challenges and the opportunities which transformation can present. The difference, however, was that whereas before my focus was on a single, albeit very large department's ICT transformation, my focus now is on a whole of government and more integrated overall approach. So let me answer the first question. Why is it that government agencies are actually now being challenged to deliver at pace? Well, one of the government's four priorities this term has been delivering better public services within tight fiscal constraints. We've been working to improve areas that are fundamental to the well-being of New Zealanders, such as health care, education, social services, and above all, strengthening the economy. The key has been doing more with existing resources, and that immediately raises issues of productivity, innovation, and increased agility and nimbleness in the provision of services. In a way, if there ever could be a silver lining to the earthquakes in Christchurch. One thing to come out of that was people learned new and smarter ways of doing things because they had to. And it's capturing that sense of innovation and flexibility that in many senses lies at the heart of the change we're undertaking. So agencies need to develop new business models. They need to work far more closely with each other as one coherent system, and they need to harness new technologies in order to meet the emerging challenges. Now, the good news is that we are in a far better position to do this than ever before. Technological advances and the arrival of big data have given us opportunities like never before to unlock the value of the information we hold and to use that information to make smarter, faster, evidence-based policy and business decisions for the benefit of all New Zealanders. So we therefore need to be able to tap into the huge volumes of data that we hold in individual agencies and bring with that data or bring that data together far more effectively for analysis and problem solving. 
Across our agencies, we have a massive suite of data. Just think for a moment about how effectively we use it. If, in fact, we use it at all, we collect it, but how is it effectively utilised? So we need to be developing a data-driven approach to the point where the customer and the customer's needs are better understood and, as a result, better able to be dis uh, served in terms of the services that we deliver. Now, you would well appreciate, probably far more than most, that without a swift and radical transformation of the way agencies manage their investments in ICT, in information and ICT-enabled systems, we will not be able to deliver the better public services that New Zealanders rightly expect. In reality, the public doesn't really care too much about what systems lie behind the services they're getting. They just want them to work now and to meet their expectations. And with the onset of the digital mobile era, those expectations have never been higher and they are increasing and they are increasing at a faster rate today than yesterday, and it will be faster tomorrow and into the future. So our challenge is to make things easier for people and also for ourselves in the process. In short, what we have to do is firstly understand and then seek to meet those expectations, and then do our level best to actually get ahead of them. The government has used the term better public services as a generic heading for what it seeks to achieve over five specific areas. We've got ten specific better public service result areas over the areas of reducing long-term welfare dependence, supporting vulnerable children, boosting skills and employment, reducing crime, and improving interaction with the government. That last responsibility fits within the internal affairs portfolio. Progress is being reported regularly to the ministers in all areas, and results are being achieved on a steady basis. Two of the ten result areas are directly relevant to the ICT community. Result areas 9 and 10 are about making it easier to do business with government. Result area 9 is led by MB, and that's about the creation of a one-stop online shop for businesses who deal with government. And core for the Result Area 9 program is the New Zealand Business Number, NZBN, a single identifier which over time aims to become the only number businesses need to use to interact with government agencies and with other businesses. By December of last year, 1.1 million companies on the company's register had been allocated an NZBN. This March, there was a month-long public consultation seeking options for the extension of existing coverage to other businesses, including sole traders, and that work is ongoing. Result Area 10, led by Internal Affairs, is aimed at ensuring New Zealanders can complete transactions with the government easily and in a digital environment. Result Area 10 has been measuring a basket of services across eight agencies for digital uptake, and the trend is steadily upwards. From a starting point of 29.9 per cent, just to be absolutely precise, in 2012, to 42 per cent for the latest figures we have for the January to March quarter this year. While there have been some seasonal fluctuations, those numbers are generally trending upwards and they've got to increase. Let me give you the example of online passports, which has been a particular success. Since November 2012, more than 220,000 people have chosen to renew their passport online. Over the same period, just over one million passports were issued. So that represents about 22% of total passport applications now being submitted and processed digitally. That's a great start, but we have the capacity and we must do better. While the deadlines are tight, agencies by and large are delivering, they prioritise and they focus on government expectations to a better extent, and as I say, overall we're seeing some positive outcomes from the programme. Good start, 
But there's a long way to go to deliver the improved services that we know New Zealanders expect. And that's why we need agencies to continue to find ways of working better to deliver that better value and results. And I look forward, along with my colleagues, to seeing the six monthly results for the 10 better public service areas when they're published next month. Now, one term that I've come to read frequently in the last few months, and you will be familiar with, is that of ICT functional leadership. And we've laid out very clear expectations with respect to this. There are three functional leadership roles covering property, procurement and ICT, and they form key pillars of the Better Public Services program. Through these roles, the government is aiming to maximise the benefits and therefore reduce the overall costs to the government of common business activities, which may not be always achieved by an agency-by-agency -agency approach. So that means finding ways of driving efficiencies, developing expertise and capability, and improving services and the delivery of those services. A year ago, virtually, on the 17th of June to be precise last year, the Cabinet approved the ICT Strategy and Action Plan through to 2017. And as you know, that sets out the four-year plan for ICT-enabled transformation. The Government Chief Information Officer, with the rather mysterious title the GCIO, is required to report regularly, both formally and informally, on progress towards achieving the Strategy and Action Goals the Action Plan's goals. As well as when meeting on a weekly basis with me, the GCIO also meets each month with the ICT Ministers Group. That's a group of ministers chaired by the Minister of Finance, and it includes the Ministers for Economic Development, State Services, Communications and Information Technology, Revenue, and me. The purpose of the ministerial group is to focus on the longer-term objectives of government ICT strategy. We look at the ongoing development and implementation of the Action Plan, and we stay abreast of ICT investment and assurance matters. And the value of these meetings is that they enable a group of uh, key government ministers in this field to take the pulse, discuss the issues and keep up with what is happening, and challenge the relevant officials always with regard to progress. There are no grey areas. We've set out our expectations pretty clearly, and the government is following progress towards realising the goals of the Strategy and Action Plan. We're also taking steps to help agencies transform. Last July, the State Sector Public Finance and Crown Entities Acts were all amended to give the State Services Commissioner greater responsibility in the development of capability and capacity for senior leadership. Fourteen Chief Information Officer roles in the public service have been identified as key and these appointments need to be agreed with the GCIO. These CIO roles are amongst those that have a significant impact right across the system and are critical to the delivery of operational services and government priorities. That list is reviewed regularly and it will change over time as functional leadership develops and new priorities emerge. At the same time, the responsibilities of chief executives have been extended to ensure they consider collective interests of government and longer-term sustainability, and these requirements now form part of their KPIs. Ministers are constantly thinking about ways in which transformation can be encouraged and accelerated. So today, I'm very pleased to announce that the government has approved the extension of the three functional leadership mandates to a wider group of agencies. Now, since July, last, or July 2012, rather, the ICT functional leadership process has applied to 33 public and non-public service departments. But as of today, ICT functional leadership will now apply to another 27 agencies. Do not panic. I'm not going to read out the list in full. But it includes the ACC, Housing New Zealand, NZQA, NZTA, NZTE, we're good at acronyms, aren't we? The EQC, the Tertiary Education Commission, and 20 district health boards. Now, what all this means is that all of these agencies will now be required to share their ICT investment strategies with the GCIO to ensure that they line up with the greater goals 
of the ICT strategy and action plan. And those agencies will also be required to now work with the GCIO on ICT assurance matters and, and required also to adopt any ICT common capabilities that are mandatory. This is a hugely positive move. It will make a massive difference to the ability of the GCIO to build one efficient ICT ecosystem right across government. And expanding that functional leadership mandate to other publicly funded agencies means greater savings and efficiencies can also be gained. I am not ruling out extending the GCIO's mandate to more agencies in the future, but we will carefully review how the extended mandate works in practice before we decide to do so. The government recognises that transformation requires dedicated funding and resourcing, and the GCIO has been allocated $4 million each year through to 2016-17 to develop ICT functional leadership roles, along with another $1.5 million each year to develop system-wide ICT assurance. Other mechanisms are also available, such as the Better Public Services Seed Fund, which was established to speed up the development of BPS reform priorities. That fund is available for the development of cross-agency initiatives that contribute to better public services and deliver improvements across the system. Funding covers one-off development costs, for example, exploration, business case development and design. Ongoing business as usual delivery costs, however, are outside the scope of the BPS seed fund. And we are also asking functional leaders to clearly identify the areas in which they need further assistance from us. We're aware that some aspects of the long-term sustainable funding model for ICT functional leadership in particular the model for ICT common capabilities, still need to be resolved. And we have a range of mechanisms currently in place to fund the ICT functional leadership for the short to mid-term, but we are recognising the fact that in the longer term a different model may well be required. All of these new ways of business, or doing business rather, are a departure from the way we've done things over the past few years. So our support systems have to change accordingly. And just as the challenge from the public is for a now solution, the increasing obligation on the public sector is to be to channel its operations into that now response mode. Of course, these are not small matters. The Treasury and the DIA are looking pretty closely at this at the moment, and I'm expecting some firmer proposals to be finalised in the next few months. We're also ensuring that appropriate assurance processes are put in place during this time of rapid change. It's a truism we know, but we've got to keep reminding ourselves of and repeating, that major change brings with it major risks. And so we have to have strong assurance processes in place to ensure that these risks are firstly identified, secondly mitigated and finally managed. The GCIO has released ICT assurance frameworks and all agencies that are under the GCIO mandate are now required to adhere to those frameworks. The new system-wide ICT assurance approach will focus on ensuring agencies can effectively manage their ICT investments to be sure they deliver the benefits they require. Last year, the Cabinet approved a cloud computing risk and assurance framework, which clearly sets out the steps that agencies are required to follow if they are considering adopting a cloud solution. Each solution must be looked at on a case-by-case -case basis, and no data above the restricted category can be housed in an offshore cloud solution. As we move increasingly into the digital world, we must also ensure that we are following best practices in privacy and security so citizens can be confident that their information will be protected. Protecting the privacy of personal information from improper access and use by government and other agencies has been a particular area of interest for me, going right back to the Information Privacy Bill, a Members' Bill which I introduced to Parliament way back in 1991, which became the forerunner of our modern Privacy Act. 
I am acutely aware, therefore, of the need for proper and robust systems to protect the privacy of personal information from the intrusion of a coercive or a prying state and for clear accountabilities to be exercised when there are breaches alongside the development of new ICT systems. This is a compact, actually, that we must never lose sight of. Citizens will trust the government with their information only so long as they are confident that the government will not misuse their information. Now, we are currently halfway through a two-year information privacy and security work program following the high-profile privacy breaches that occurred during 2012 and the subsequent review by the GCIO into publicly accessible systems. Agencies are reporting regularly on their growing capability and their plans to improve. So we've created the role of the Government Chief Privacy Officer to ensure there is a long-term focus on setting privacy standards and building privacy capability within agencies. And there is also wider work underway. This week is Connect Smart Week, an initiative aimed at building awareness amongst all New Zealanders of cyber security risks, and it's being led by the Department of Prime Minister and Cabinet. And there are some quite exciting issues around that and a lot of interest from the commercial sector about ways in which we can all become that much smarter and more secure in our handling of cyber data. We've also set up the New Zealand Data Futures Forum, a government working group to advise ministers on how the collection, sharing and use of business and personal information will impact public services in the coming years. The forum will identify opportunities to maximise the benefits of big data but it will also sound any warning bells about things that we need to consider on the data management fronts. They are constantly consulting on their ideas and submissions on uh, their current thoughts actually close tomorrow. So if you've got a submission you wish to make, there's still time to do so. Finally, we've made it clear that we expect agencies to collaborate and to work together to achieve outcomes. No single agency can do this on their own. We are building a coherent digital network. We have made changes to ensure that a system-wide view can be taken, and we want to do everything we can to make it much easier for agencies to collaborate and to work together. The GCIO is working alongside agencies to develop a new ICT operating model for the government. But the GCIO cannot do it alone. Success will depend on the willingness of people at every level of every agency to understand and embrace ministerial expectations and to pursue the opportunities that transformation offers. Overall, I think this is a really exciting time to be involved in the public service. It's a time when there will be new opportunities for many and new chances for fresh and innovative thinking to come forward. We know what our objective is. We want everyone to have the opportunity to use the advantages offered by the new digital environment to their maximum potential. We know the, ch the challenges that are inherent within that. And we also know of the many bright ideas that are generated around coffee tables or in office conversations and elsewhere. Our challenge is to channel all of these into coherent and positive action. And the first step to take is to recognise and to embrace the change process that lies ahead. And then from there, to move to the innovation of ideas and vision that means we can achieve our common objectives. I want to just leave you with one story. It's one that uh, my former colleagues in, internal, in, in Inland Revenue will have heard me say time and time again. But it demonstrates for me the challenge ahead and the level of public expectation that is upon us. A year or so ago, I had a visit one Saturday morning from a constituent who wanted to talk about her daughter's student loan repayment. By coincidence, the day beforehand, IRD had just launched a mobile app that allowed you to better recognise your student loan debt and uh, other information about it. 
So I felt pretty chipper when this constituent turned up on Saturday morning that I was able to say to her, well, look, we've just launched this mobile app. Your daughter will be able to follow her loan progress uh, with great detail. Um, I was greeted with an absolutely stone face. I know that, she said, but she still can't pay online, can she? Which was true. And that, I think, is the point at issue. Here was something that was less than 24 hours old. The consumer had already tested it out and found that it was good as far as it went, but they wanted more. And that, to me, is the metaphor of what government ICT change is all about. Yes, fine, you've done so far so good, but I, as a customer, want the next step. Your challenge is to be the providers of that next step, and just to make things a bit more difficult, with the associated confidence and assurance that it will all work pretty much all of the time. I wish you luck for this conference. I look forward to working with you as we go through the process of innovative ideas and upskilling ourselves and our thought processes and getting to the point where we can all take maximum advantage from the technologies now becoming available. Thank you for what you do. Enjoy the next couple of days and I look forward to hearing more about your deliberations and to working with you in the future. Have a good conference. Thank you very much, Peter. I think that's really thrown down the, the gauntlet for us in, in a great way. Uh, re things that really stood out for me were the expansion of the functional leadership uh, scope. I think that's a, a, a big step forward. And also the, the, the idea you mentioned early on about data-driven uh, policy and development, I think that's a really good challenge for us amongst all of it. So thank you again very much for your time. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, a, a little gift for you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks thank a lot. Thanks, thank Peter. you very much. Everybody. Yes. Another.